basically what we're going to be doing this week is covering the tools very quickly. We did a little bit of introducing the tools when we did the um, the pen in the last one, but there's a bunch of tools in Fusion. Um, so I'm just going to quickly cover some of the like most commonly used ones. Some of them are like very specific and get used in very advanced purposes that you will basically never do that I've like never used myself. Um, but then there's a handful that you use all the time. So just covering quickly those sorts of things. So I'll start off by giving myself something to work with. I'm just going to make a box. And on the box, I will give it a little eh, cylindrical top. And then we can use the tools on these to just sort of show things off. So the first tool, obviously, is Extrude, which we were using the last one. Basically, it's a push and pull. And it uses the shape of a face as the shape that it is pushing and pulling. If you have a sketch on a face, so if I create a uh, polygon here, it uses the profile of that sketch or that face as the push or pull. So you can either pull out new shapes onto your bodies or Fusion is smart enough to contextually understand that if you start pushing into an object, it turns red and decides, oh, you probably want to cut out that shape from your object. So extrude is like 99% of what you're doing in Fusion to create or destroy or, you know, recontour any of your objects that you're working on. The next tool in here is revolve and revolve it's pretty useful. I'll actually create a new sketch to kind of show this off. So I'll make a little center line and I will use a spline to kind of show off how you could do fancy things with it. Finish sketch. So what Revolve does is it takes your normal profile shape and an axis that it wants to rotate around, which is why I made the little center line and it spins it around that axis. You can tell it a certain angle if you don't want it to go 360 degrees. Or you can tell it to be two-sided or symmetric if you want it to be two separate angles or symmetric angles. But the Revolve is really good for doing you know, water bottles, uh, weird... Um, I guess this is kind of a flanged gear kind of shape almost. Um, organic stuff it's really useful for, anything that's got to have um, rotational symmetry. Um, actually, what I'm looking at this and seeing is basically chess pieces. Super useful for chess pieces. Um, doesn't come up a ton of the time. Doing organic shapes in Fusion is always a little bit of an interesting um, challenge, but it's a useful tool. The next one in the list is a sweep, and for that I will actually take the sketch that we have. Um, actually, I will create a new sketch. So let's go ahead, go back, delete that sketch, delete, nope. Hide the body there for a second. So I will create a squiggle using a spline tool. Squiggle, 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 finish that sketch, and then perpendicular to this line, I'm going to create another new sketch, and at the tail of that squiggle I'll just make a circle. And so what a sweep does is you pick the profile, and then you pick a path, and it will... Oh, it helps if I'm actually showing the bodies, not hiding the bodies. There we go. You pick a profile on a path, and it pushes that profile along the path. Um, you can think of it kind of like a wire. And so in this case, I did a simple circular profile. So obviously it looks a lot like a wire or a pipe. Um, but obviously the nice things about... Whoa, where did it go? The nice thing about Fusion is you could do any kind of shape for this. So if I wanted to make a polygonal pipe instead and set this polygon 
Ooh. Nope. Delete that polygon. Tell the polygon I want it to have eight sides. Nope. Eight sides. Nope. Why you not do what I tell you to do? Tab. Eight sides. There we go. Then we could go back into our sweep and tell it instead of the circle, I want this one. And it will decide it's too big because it's probably going to be pinching and crushing into itself there. <laughs> So what I can do instead is grab the line, flatten it out a little bit, and obviously it updates automatically, so we used to have a really big kinky bend in the pipe there. And now I can replace the profile. And there we go. So these, yeah, these are super useful. Sweep is super useful for doing um, wires and pipes and things along those lines um, in designs. The other thing that you can do in Fusion with sweeps to create these kind of complicated paths and lines and things is if I go to Preferences, and this takes a few seconds when there's screen capture going on, under Design, there's this little checkbox which is usually disabled by default called Allow 3D Sketching of Lines and Splines. And so I'm going to hit OK on that. And so what I can do, I'm going to have to create a few planes for this to kind of demonstrate. So I'll create a plane over here, and I'll create a construction plane over here. So I just got three planes sort of offset from the center, and create a few sketches. So I'll create, I want to create a point randomly in space over there, create on this one, a point over here, and then create on the back plane, point over here. And so you can kind of see that I've created a kind of a constellation effect because I had three planes at different depths offset from each other. And because I turned on that little checkbox that says I can do 3D sketches, if I then go in and create a spline and start picking these 3D points in space, you can kind of see that this curve is actually bending in the 3D space, which you usually couldn't do in Fusion if that little checkbox wasn't enabled. But because we did, turned it on, you can create complicated curving shapes like that. And then you could use this path to create 3D wires that then bend and move throughout um, your designs. So this is how I did a lot of the like hoses and wires in the Poragon was creating a series of, of 3D points and then connecting them up with splines and then using that as a path to like trace out the wires. So that's sweep. Loft is super useful and interesting. Let's go ahead and roll back the timeline to get rid of those. So if you're trying to combine two shapes that aren't the same, so in this case I will create circle and finish that one. And then let me create an offset. And on this one, I will create a polygon. Obviously, these two shapes are not the same. And so under normal circumstances, it would be really difficult to try to figure out, like, how do I transition from um, like this polygon shape into a circular shape. Like on the pencil, we kind of cut the outsides off and that sort of did the transition for us. Not really. Um, that's what loft is for. Loft sort of merges between two profiles and you can see you've got these control points to kind of determine where it um, interpolates between the shapes on one on one profile into the other. So I could kind of move the sharp corners around and change when that transition happens. So that in this case, it's round, 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 sharp corner, and then it's transitioning into like the flat edge here, and then continuing that to that corner there. So you can kind of see that pinching effect it's creating on the surface. Um, by default, Fusion's um, 
contextual setup. It kind of figures out where your corners are and tries to evenly space everything out to make a nice, rounded, uh, even transition, which is usually what you want to go for. But if you need to slightly tweak things, you have that option available to you, which is nice and helpful. The other things in there, which I'm actually going to create another sketch to point out from the side, is I'm going to create a spline. It's going to be touching on this edge, dip down, and then touch on that corner, and I'll finish. Let me create a loft again between these two. You can also use rails, guiding rails here, to determine how a loft works. So if I click this little guiding rail, you can see that it's still transitioning from this um, hexagon into the circle, but it's using this rail to say that I want the profile to kind of taper down and go this way, and everything's following with it. You can either use um, edge rails, which are, um, this is connected from edge to edge and it's following and dipping below it, or you could use a center line rail if I was connected from the center of each profile and use that to determine it. So you can kind of use this in the same way that you, you would use um, a sweep and have a path that kind of tells it how to twist and bend through space. But you can also use the loft um, differently from the sweep. The loft is changing, transitioning between two dissimilar shapes. So it's sort of an advanced sweep in that sense. Cool. So we can roll back from that. And I will just delete all features after the history marker. Um, ribs and webs are used in designing um, stuff for like injection molding or that has to be machined and what you're trying to do is like lighten the design and create an internal structure. Um, for most of what I'm doing, which is 3D printed stuff, because um, slicers like Simplify and Cura and um, Prusa Slicer, they all include um, infill calculation by default. Don't really have to worry about that so much, but if you're designing stuff for injection molding or CNC, you might be a little bit more um, interested in like exploring how to use the ribs and webs to reinforce designs that are otherwise hollowed. Um, in this case, we won't get into it too much. So, turning on the cube I made at the beginning again, the whole tool, if I pick a side, allows you to place a hole in the surface without having to use a profile. So I didn't have to like trace out a circle and then use that circle as the hole. And it also gives you, um, it basically, it's, it's allowing you to create holes that are machined. So it gives you all sorts of types for, is it counterboard, is it countersunk, is it um, straight, is it tapped, so it's, does it have threading? Um, is it taper tap, so it's got threading that's then following like a countersink? Does the, bot um, does the bottom of it flatten out, or does it follow like um, an angle as if you had like the tip of a drill bit pressing into the surface? Um, this is probably more useful for machining type purposes, like trying to figure out if I was to drill into the surface, what would the resulting shape be? Um, most of the time I tend to trace out and cut with extrudes, but the hole is, it's useful to know that it's there and available if you need it. Um, whoa. And actually, let's go ahead and leave the hole on the surface there, because it will help demonstrate the next bit. The next tool, which is also super useful, is thread. And what thread lets you do is pick um, rounded surfaces so obviously you can see here it's highlighting the inside of that hole that we tapped, which is circular, and the uh, the outside ring, uh, outside face of this like cylinder piece, but it's not showing the flat faces on the cube. It's not showing the inside of the um, like hexagonal cookie cutter hole that we punched here, um, because threading is basically what it sounds like. It lets you create threads as if it were a, um, a screw on your surface. Something to point out here is it kind of looks as if you have threads, especially if I hit OK, it kind of looks as if we had threads. But um, similar to what we were covering in the Blender courses, this is just a normal map or a bump map. It's kind of affecting the lighting, but if you go from the side, you can tell that the sides of the cylinder are still perfectly straight wall. It hasn't actually um, 
changed the the silhouette or added any geometry to the surface. It is just like faking it with lighting. Um, so if you if you know that you're going to be going into machining and you know what your threads are, um, and you don't need to worry about them in the model, this is a lot more like processor efficient than having physical geometry in there. But if you were trying to like 3D print threads or something along those lines, you want to have actual physical threads. So if I go back in there and check the little model checkbox, hey, we have actual physical threads. Um, and then under the other settings, you have all sorts of threading standards, isometric, trapezoid, GB, DSN, ANSI, um, and then different sizes and kinds. This is where machinists probably know a lot more about this stuff than I do. But you can pick different sizes of thread. That's probably too big for the surface here. Different sizes of thread, different pitches of thread. Um, and they will follow like actual machining standards. The other thing that's kind of clever and cool to point out is, so this, this one up here, if I inspect it, is what, like less than two mils, around one millimeter in radius. Whereas the one down here, is yeah four millimeters in diameter two mils in radius a lot thicker the thread tool will kind of automatically guess based on the radius of whatever you're picking so this was yep one and a half and like two mils diameter so it decided it's got to be a two and a half mil thread contextually it decided that makes the most sense you can obviously you could change it afterwards but it contextually decided that must be a two and a half mil Whereas on this one, if I were to inspect it, we will probably guess that it wants to be a 4 mil thread. So if we go back, threading, it guesses, yep, it guesses it wants to be a 4 millimeter thread. So um, it's really useful if you're trying to punch out your holes from your sketches, um, do them the right size, and then add the threads. And the threads, it will figure out pretty much like what the best pick thread for that hole is, which is super useful. Um, in addition to this, something that's also kind of useful to point out, so let's add a 4 millimeter thread, make sure it's actually physically modeled. In Fusion, you have access to add objects from the McMaster car library. So if I were to um, go to uh, insert from McMaster car component, you can actually look up screws, bolts, all kinds of things. So if I want to pick a round head screw, a Phillips head screw and tell it to be M4 because we know that that's an M4 and pick one of these. So let's say um, I want it to be a black oxide screw, M4, we'll pick this part number. If you go to product detail, you can see all kinds of details. If you wanted to order them from McMaster Car, you could select a quantity and order it. Or if you scroll down, it gives you the diagram, and up there you can see a little CAD model. McMaster Car, for most of the products in the library, gives you the option to actually save and download from their library actual physical components. So if you're trying to figure out what your screws actually should be and how they'll fit into your design, you can go to McMaster Car and pick screws or bolts or any other kind of part and insert it into your design. You can see it's inserted it. It got it even included the um the part number. So if you forgot what the part number was and you needed to look it up again, there's your part number. And then if I grab this and move it into the hole roughly. We should see if I go to one of the transparent views. Yeah, you can kind of see that the threads line up. Move. There we go. There are ways to more precisely align it than just like dragging and dropping it, but you can see that the threads we picked were M4, and the screw we picked is M4, and so they actually line up perfectly. So if you were designing a 3D printed part and you wanted it to, you know, uh, made up with a specific screw pitch that you knew that you had, like you had a box of screws and you went, ah, that this needs to use a M8 screw, you can test it, make sure it will fit, and then 3D print it to that size and it will fit with your actual physical screws. Super useful.
Um, and so changing the view modes as I was just doing there, you can go down to display settings and there's mesh, uh, not mesh display, uh, visual style. There we go. And what I was doing on my keyboard is the shortcuts of key control four, five, six, seven. Um, and they have different kind of wireframes views, shaded views, shaded views with like x-ray view on top of it, shaded view with the lines, which is what I find to be most useful because the lines kind of show you what profiles you can actually select, what faces you can select, whereas the flat shaded one, you can't really tell. And then some of the transparent views are useful if you're trying to see what like internal details are. So we can go ahead. Let's just roll back the timeline to get rid of these last few steps. Delete those features. Going down the list, obviously we have our primitives down here, so we can actually add to our scene basic shapes, spheres, torses, which is a lot easier than trying to, like if I were trying to add a sphere, I'd have to like, essentially I'd probably make a circle and then revolve it with a torus, I'd probably make a circle and then revolve it around the center, leaving a gap in the middle. Um, or I could just use that tool to very quickly add a very specific um, I could do it in one step instead of multiple steps, essentially. Next up that are super useful are the patterning tools. So what I'll do here is create a little cut on the surface. Let's maybe add a little circle, circular cut. Why did that? Oh, I added it to the middle. Oh, that's fine. I'll just cut this straight through, eee, all the way through the body. And then we can pattern. Start up with rectang rectangular pattern. And so what I'll do is pick this face. And the pattern tool asks for a couple of offsets and then how many times to copy it. So if I want to offset it by one in the x-axis, Uh, I may have messed this up just because of how complicated my scene got. Let me just reset everything. Delete all these things. Let's just roll back and delete all the things. Start with a fresh, fresh one. Box. Big box. And then let's create a hole. So, rectangular pattern. I want to select that face. And in the z-axis, there we go. So you can push it down, you can push it across, and it will create a pattern of them, an even pattern. And you can turn it up. So two, or I could try to do four or five. Those would be overlapping, so it would probably create like a um, sawtooth pattern doing it that way. Um, And so let's actually see. Yep, sawtoothy kind of pattern. And you can go back and change that. If you didn't want it to do in one axis or not the other, you could turn one of them down to like zero and then only do it in one direction. Oops, give it a few seconds. And then you have almost like a gauge block kind of effect. And the other thing is, um, so let's do this again, but let's do this. Delete that step, pattern again. The other thing is the distance type you're using was there was extent. There's extent and there's spacing. So extent is if I pick a direction I want to go. So I'll go down. This number, 18 millimeters, is the distance from the first one to the last one is 18 and then it divides them up, that spacing up evenly, so that five or four or however many you pick will fit exactly evenly spaced in that distance, whereas 
spacing instead says what is the distance between each of these. So if I set it to like three millimeters between each of these, four, five, six, each one is added to the end and offset by that spacing. So depending on your circumstances, you might either want to have a specific distance between them and have that be a fixed distance, or you might want the pattern to only exist across one distance and then evenly space them between those two endpoints. Which is nice and useful. And you can do it not just with features on a body, but you can do it with whole bodies. So if I select the whole body, pattern it, pick a direction, I can pattern this whole body, holes and all, and pattern it like that. Um, yeah, the circumstances you need patterning is unique to whatever you're trying to do, but I guess for this case it could be almost like dominoes. I kind of like that. Okay, next up in the patterning is circular pattern, which is pretty straightforward. If I pick an axis and tell it I want to use this body, it will pattern it in a circle around that axis. If I increase the number of them, obviously it cre increases the number of them. And you can tell it, instead of doing a full 360, you can tell it to pattern across a specific angle. So this is 85 degrees and eight of them in that 85 degrees. Obviously in that case, because they were all touching the axis, they've created this kind of overlapping effect, which is not necessarily what you'd want to go for. But um, perhaps, similar to what we did with uh, what we were doing in Blender, where we had like the, um, the fire hydrant with bolts, maybe you would want to make a uh, little bolt, finish sketch, make a little bolt as a new body, and then you could pattern that as a circle around the middle there. And then you'd have bolts patterned on a surface. So it's essentially the same kind of idea as having the, uh, the revolve, but in this case, you're actually copying a, pat uh, a number of objects around that, which can be useful. And then obviously mirroring is super useful if you're trying to make something that is symmetrical. So in this case, let's make sphere. Oops, scale it up. And then I'm going to make a nice little cookie cutter hole into it. And cut that out symmetrically. And now, if I want to create mirror, what I could do is grab features, and features are steps on the timeline. So faces are just individual faces, bodies are whole objects, and features are steps on the timeline. So if I wanted to mirror the uh, cut that I did here, I could mirror that step across the center axis here and hit OK. And it mirrors that whole cut and the contours of that cut across the center line there. And the other thing is you can do, you can tell it to mirror uh, cuts and things. You can also mirror to duplicate objects. So if you had half an object and you wanted to duplicate it across, what I'll do is make a little construction plane here, offset it, and use the mirror to copy the body across the center and then have two of them. So in a lot of cases, if I'm trying to make a slightly symmetrical design, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start modeling one half of it, cut the whole object in half, and then duplicate it across, and then have two copies, a left and a right side. Um, and for 3D printing especially, that can be super useful because that means that because I cut it flat down the middle, I then have a flat side that can then lay on the print bed and then print from that flat um, foundation. So those are pretty much all of the creation tools.
as it sounds like, the creation tools are used for cuts and extrude kind of uh, manipulations to create new geometry. Whereas over here in the modify tab are all the tools that are used to then like affect that geometry to like um, recontour it, redesign it. Um, so the fillet is probably the most commonly used one. It's used for creating rounded edges. You can select one edge or multiple edges and it kind of figures it out. If you push it too far, it will yell at you because you're going like past it would try to it's trying to like roll around a corner that it's not allowed to go past so it can't really figure out how to go any further with the um the radius um for machining this probably means makes a lot more use for 3d printed designs doing fillets may or may not be useful um It can be complicated, especially trying to do in the um, the Z axis, trying to do stair stepping effects. Um, for three D printing, you generally want a chamfer instead, which is instead of a round, it's a like a beveled, angled cut that's flat, which is typically easier for a three D um, print. Because if you're thinking of like a three D printer is slicing layer by layer, doing a rounded edge the angle between the, or the distance between each of the edges increases over time, so you can get a really pyramid stair-stepping effect. Whereas if you have a constant angle, angled slope, you have an even spacing between each of your layers, which creates a much more smooth transition. Um, so you avoid overhangs by using um, chamfers rather than fillets in a 3D printed design, which is typically what you want to be going for. So if you're trying to create a, a sloping surface, usually chamfer is a better idea. Gonna reset again. The next tool on the list is the shell, which is pretty straightforward and easy. I'm just gonna create a box here to show it off. What a shell does is hollow out an object based on the faces you pick. So if I pick this face and tell it I want the object to be five millimeters thick, you can see this face has disappeared, and the whole object now is, if I switch to one of the X-ray modes, is now hollowed out to be five evenly five millimeter thick all the way around. And if I start picking other faces, it will remove those faces and the remaining bits of the model will still be an even five millimeters thick. This can be pretty useful for 3D printed designs, hollowing them out and making sure that you only need what you need. Um, and you can also do this on complicated shapes and it will figure out how to hollow them evenly. So if I had Really complicated sphere. And then, if I were to cut that sphere, oh, that missed. Well done, me. That completely missed. Ah, create a circle. Or no, not create a circle. Let's create a polygon. Polygon. And use that to cut it out. And then shell from here. Even though it's rounded, it's still figuring out how to. I guess it doesn't display it nicely. But you can kind of peek inside there and see that it is, in fact, hollow to an even thickness. And if I were to do one of my inspection tools, like the, where is it, section analysis, you can see that it is actually hollow. So, shell is pretty useful. Rolling back, deleting those features. Um, draft less useful. I tend not to use it because it's a little bit indirect way of, of modeling things. So let's create a box to demonstrate this. Draft. Draft, you pick a plane and then you pick the edge that you're going to be rotating. And basically you are rotating this face at the intersection where it connects to the other plane. So I can kind of offset this 
by 55 degrees and it will figure out how to you know, stretch the rest of the object to compensate for that. The reason I'm not a huge fan of this is that you don't really have any, besides the angle, you don't have any control over the dimensions of the object. Um, I'm sure there are situations where this is useful, but generally if I'm trying to create something that's um, you know, sloped at a specific angle, I also want to know the distance of it, so I'd use a chamfer and start chamfering it by a specific distance, and then I could also do um, not just equal distance, I could do two distances, make it a certain distance at the top, a certain distance at the side, or do distance and angle, set a specific angle, and then set how far or how long that cut should be. So I feel like chamfer has a lot more actual like um, dimensioning and control over the final effect of your of your slope, whereas draft seems to be fairly indirect, which is why I'm not a huge fan of using that, and I don't tend to use it in a lot of my designs unless I'm just like freehand modeling and not worrying about specific dimensions. Um, so yeah, not a huge fan of that. Scale is pretty simple to, to understand. You pick an object, you can scale it up and down, and the point here is like the, um, the point around which it's actually scaling. So let's go down to scale again, because that got slightly confusing. So if I select this corner, it will scale from that corner. If I instead were to pick that bottom corner, it will scale from that corner. So that becomes like the center of scaling. Um, and you can do non-uniform scaling as well. So if you wanted to like stretch it and push and pull it in different directions, you could do that as well. Um, again, typically you don't tend to do scaling unless you're like freehand modeling, but um, it can be useful. The combined tools, pretty simple, straightforward. Um, a lot of the time, like Fusion is basically doing a, a combine, the operation here, cut, join, intersect. It's doing combine in the process of creating an extrude or creating a new object. But if I tell it to do new body here, make these a separate object anyway, combine just lets you manually either join or cut. Um, these are simple Boolean operations. The interesting one is intersect. In intersect you can think of like a um, annotations, useful for it. You can think of it like a Venn diagram. So you've got two overlapping regions, and it's whatever the um, the region that's left over in the middle is is what gets kept. And so, just like a Venn diagram, the intersect. I took the sphere into the uh, face of the cube, and so what I'm left behind with is the flat face of the cube and like the bowl shape at the bottom of the sphere, which is the two bits that were kind of overlapping in between, so that's kind of the Venn diagram of the two parts. Um, kind of niche use cases where you actually use um, intersect versus just a normal cut or a combine, but it can be useful in, in certain situations. So again, let's roll back, delete those. Next one, offset face, replace, split, don't tend to use a lot of these. Um, split body, split face can be useful. Um, so like I was saying uh, when I was mentioning let's create a sphere here, when I was mentioning creating uh, symmetrical designs, split body is super useful for that. So split body, you pick which body you want to split, and you create a tool either by picking one of the axes in the from the origin or if you've got sketch planes that you're actually using you could use those split body hit okay and it creates two bodies split at that point point. and so if i rolled that back i could also create an offset plane and make that split somewhere else if i wanted to so if i wanted to make that split at this one instead I can split it there, 
and then that body is split from that body at that point and extends basically along the entire plane and cuts, you know, to infinity in every direction along that one plane. Um, actually, something I didn't, that I was just doing unconsciously without pointing it out. So if I turn on the origin, you can kind of see in there, you might be able to see in there, hiding in the blue, you can kind of see, if I hide the body, there's the plane there, there's the origin planes, there's that construction plane I made. But when the body's there and I'm trying to select, you can't really select it. It just sort of, I'm selecting the surface of the sphere, but not actually the planes underneath. If you're trying to select through an object to the objects on the underside, what you do is click and hold, and it will show you in order of depth which um, like faces and objects that you can select through the other objects. So it kind of gives you an x-ray vision to like poke through the surface. So click and hold here, it says face, and then there's the XYZ plane. If I click and hold here, face, XYZ plane, XY plane, and then I can pick through a surface. There we go. So that's something that kind of came, becomes second nature is, is cl clicking through things, just clicking and holding to select through the object. And obviously it's highlighting in the list which object you're actually selecting there. All right, for the next couple, I will create something else. Let's create a couple of boxes to demonstrate the next couple. So create a little skinny box and create a bigger flatter skinny box. So the next two tools in the list here are move and align. Move, M, pretty straightforward hotkey. That's what I'm going to be using from now on. There's a few different move tools. There's the free move tool, which gives you like all of the tools. So I can either rotate on any axis I want freehand. I can move in any axis I want freehand. And then these little things are like grab points. So instead of a single axis, I can grab it on a plane. And so do X and Y on that plane. Or I can grab the center dot and move it freely in any direction, which can get a little bit confusing. but. That's the free move tool. Cancel that. We'll do the move again. The next one is just translate. So instead of having all of the tools, you have just translate or just rotate. Now rotate asks you for an axis. So I'll use that edge there and rotate around that corner. Or I could pick a different axis and rotate around that corner. And then the next couple tools in there, which are a little bit more complicated, but still pretty useful, there is point to point and point to position. So point to point means if I hover over this, you can see I get a few little like grab points pop up. So I've got the center of each face, the corners of each face, and these little triangles are the midpoint of each face. And if I hit control, these won't disappear when I let go. It kind of locks onto the face that I'm currently hovering over and shows me the points permanently instead of them only like toggling on when the mouse is over it. And so point to point, I can say I want to go from that corner and move it to this corner on this object, and it will move the whole body such that that corner is snapped to that corner. The move point to position is a little bit more freeform, similar idea. I've got a point, but then I can basically pick anywhere I want it to go. Uh, and tell it an X, Y, Z axis. Now I was trying to pick it to go to that one in space, but I guess it wants me to like manually input it. So if I do backspace 10 there, it should move it to 10 in the x-axis. Doesn't want to. I tend not to use that one because it gets a little bit weird and complicated. Oh no, it did snap to 10 in the x-axis. It just wasn't far enough to be noticeable. So let's select that object based on that point and move that point to 50 in the x-axis. There we go. That's more noticeable. It's 
yeah, it can be more precise, but it's a little bit fiddly to work with. So I tend to, if I'm ever doing a snapping sort of thing, I tend to do point to point instead of trying to like specify a specific x, y, and z axis for it. Um, but what what you will notice is if I'm using point to point, if I'm selecting this object, going from here to here, it keeps its orientation. It doesn't rotate or flip to match up with this face at all, which is where the align tool, separate from move, becomes useful. So in this case, I'm going to align from the center of this face to the top of this face, and you can see it flips it in order to actually align those two faces so they're parallel to each other. So this can be super useful if you're trying to like stack objects and, and make them match up, especially if this were at a weird angle. So if I had a chamfer on here, if this were at a weird angle, I could even set it to a really weird angle, like 50 degrees. The align tool will allow me to grab, let's say, from that edge to that face, and it aligns it there. Now in this case, I aligned it because it's, it's aligned perpendicular. You can also, as you're grabbing your align tool, you can either see it'll be flat, or depending on where you angle as you're grabbing it, you can see that it can actually rotate that tool to be perpendicular to an edge. So keeping an, keeping an eye on that little like target icon that pops up will help you see if it's going to be, that will be flat on, and so when I align, it will be flat on. That's going through the object, so I could flip it. And then if I wanted to rotate it on that surface, it's still flat to that surface, but I can rotate the angle relative to that surface. Cool. And those are pretty much all the tools that you use in here, except for the push-pull slash offset tool. These can be useful. They're similar to, um, sorry, I, thought I accidentally grabbed a fillet there. Push-pull can be similar to a um, extrude where you're just extending and retracting. The difference being that it can also expand and contract um, like rings on a surface. So if I get rid of all of this, if I create a hole on here, make it a little shallow hole, and use the push-pull tool, which is Q, I can actually expand and contract that ring. And I can actually, if I'm selecting multiple faces, I can expand and contract multiple things. So if I had, let's pattern this ring. in this direction. I can actually select multiple of these and expand and contract these all together. And you can see that if you have it break out of an edge, Fusion is clever enough to kind of figure out, OK, let's expand and contract that break in the surface. The situation that push-pull becomes um, actually really quite useful is if you're trying to create tolerances in a 3D printed design. So if you have objects that are meant to um, insert into each other or um, slide past each other in any kind of manufactured design, but especially in 3D printing because it's less precise than other machining um, processes, you need to have a little bit of a gap. So there's some wiggle room for those two parts to actually be able to move freely past each other. Um, so in this case, I've got this little um, circle here. What if I were to extrude, make a little pin, and make this a new body? So this is a new separate body sitting in that hole, but it is exactly perfectly flush in every dimension, mathematically perfectly the same size as the hole underneath it. Um, if I were to be giving this to like Nick, who can machine things within you know hundreds of thousands of an inch and send stuff into space, um, he could probably machine two bits of metal that are almost exactly perfectly identical to each other, and then with a little bit of lubrication, they could slide past each other freely. In a 3D printed design, 
um, because you're dealing with you know a wobbly melted extrusion of plastic through a half a millimeter roughly sized hole um, these would not slide past each other nicely um, the other problem being that as plastic cools it tends to shrink and expand so you run into problems um, generally in a design if like this pin was meant to slot into this hole you'd want there to be a little bit of a gap to give some wiggle room in case of plastic shrinking or you know any other number of reasons to allow them to slide past each other freely and that's where push pull can come in handy so i can take these two and i know they're exactly the same size and then use push pull and move that in by 0.1 of a millimeter and then i give myself a little bit of a gap if i roll back in the timeline you know if i were sketching these out i know that these are exactly the same size but then with given a little bit of a gap from each other and actually i will make a slightly bigger design here to show it off or no this is fine what i actually prefer to do if i'm doing really complicated designs like i'm doing um like i'm doing the portal gun or i'm doing any kind of prop where i have lots of uh moving parts that have to interact with each other under the modify panel there's this little option called change parameters and what parameters let you do is set up kind of universal variables so like if, if anybody's done programming before you set up a variable a variable is a placeholder that stores data and then you can use that variable in other places to call that data back up so in this case in every mechanical design every prop i design i create a, a parameter here or a variable called tolerance gap and i found that on my printer somewhere between a quarter of a millimeter or half a millimeter of gap is perfect and if i hit okay i now have a parameter called tolerance gap which is set to a value of half a millimeter and if i go back in here make a push pull i can either manually type in a distance or I can tell it to use tolerance gap and it will use tolerance gap now in this case it's doing half a millimeter outwards i want it to go inwards so i'll set this to negative tolerance gap and now i know that this has half a millimeter gap between these two parts and so if i wanted to make another one let's extrude this let's make another little pin new body let's also give this one negative tolerance gap the reason i like having parameters rather than just doing tolerance gap is you can see in the timeline i've got the offset for this one and i've got the offset for this one and if i, I decide later oh this is too much too much i don't want half a millimeter of, of sloppiness between the two parts i want only 0.2 of a millimeter of slop between the two parts it would be really tedious especially in big complicated designs to have to go through every single offset and try to change them by hand but because these are all using tolerance gap i don't have to go through them one by one i just go back to my parameters and say i don't want that to be half a mil i want that to be a quarter of a millimeter and when i hit ok it decides it doesn't like that because because that pin has a flat face and gets annoyed Let's make a pin over here because this pin shouldn't get annoyed. Negative tolerance gap. Hey. Change parameters. If I set this to 0.1, they all update to 0.1. If I set this to 0.5, they all update to 0.5. So parameters, super, super useful as you start getting into more and more advanced designs for very quickly updating a, a one property that will change everything in the in the design and like cascade down the timeline so basically every design i ever do there's always a parameter called tolerance or tolerance gap um and then depending on what kind of um what other parameters i might want to update you know if i'm making some kind of i don't know if i'm making like a water pistol or something i might have a parameter for the length of the barrel so i could dynamically update the length of the barrel to make a short one and a long one and make variations on that design parameters super super useful and you can do weird interesting things in parameters where like this one's tolerance half 
And you can put in there tolerance cap over 2, and then you have a parameter that is always half of whatever the tolerance gap is. So if I set that to 5, the tolerance half is now 0.25. So there are people who do really crazy parametric designs where they have like complicated maths depending on like the sign of an angle and then weird things that I don't ever need to get into, but it's available to you if you need that. And yeah, so those are pretty much most of the tools that you use on a daily basis. Um, the other two that I tend to use, inspect is useful. Inspect is a little measuring tool. You can actually pick between two edges and it will say, what's the distance between those two edges or the angle or the length of the, uh, the edges that you have selected. Or if you were to pick a circle, you get over here, what's its radius, what's its diameter. Um, so inspect is super useful for measuring things. The other one, which I demonstrated earlier when we were showing off the, um, the shell on the sphere is section analysis. And section analysis is basically cross sections. You can think of it like an MRI where it like scans across the body and gives you cross sections. So if I pick a face and start scanning down, the purple shows you the cross sections. And so this is in much more complicated designs when I'm like trying to create 3D printed stuff. This is useful for seeing, you know, what are my tolerances, what are my gaps, are things overlapping, are they are they joining in the right ways? Um, so that can be super, super useful. So if I back up to some of my other more complicated designs. Whoa. And then it thinks about it for a while because I'm also doing a recording. Please load. Hey, there we go. In this case, section analysis can be super useful for, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, what's going on on the inside of this? I can't tell what's where and how they're all overlapping and, and joining. So scanning through here, I get kind of an MRI cross-section where I can see, okay, so there's the little bolt thing. It's inside there. There's a coil spring that's wrapping around. So I can see the coil spring has enough of a gap that it's not, you know, um, sticking through the post there as I'm scanning along. The coil spring is coiling. You can kind of see the yellow bits. There's like the trigger as it intersects and it's got a little bit of a gap in there. So section analysis can be super useful for like designing 3D prints and figuring stuff out. But those are pretty much all of the tools that are commonly used on a daily basis. So yeah, that's pretty much everything for this week was just going over the tools and how to use them and what they do in Fusion.